In February, NASA's newest Mars rover, Perseverance, landed on the red planet. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. But the meat of the mission is just beginning. For the first time ever, scientists are bringing back material from another planet. These samples will help planetary scientists answer one of the most important scientific and existential questions. Is there life outside Earth? But one surprising key to this mission, it can't be done without these six inch titanium tubes. There are 43 of these tubes on Perseverance. That rover is now trucking through Jezero Crater, gathering chalk size samples in the tubes. It's already drilled and collected its first samples. This is Jezero Crater. It's important because it's an area that was once home to an ancient river delta. And where there's water, there's usually life. NASA spent billions on the whole Perseverance operation. Though the tubes don't look like much, it took the agency about a decade to develop them. Every detail was thought out. Just look at this intricate system aboard the rover that houses them. Once they're filled, the tubes will be among the most important packages in planetary science, rivaling the containers from the Apollo program that brought home chunks of the moon, and more recent ones with asteroid samples. In short, these little tubes are a big deal. So what makes them so out of this world? And why did NASA spend so much time developing them? Ya te explico. The tubes are mission critical because once they're shipped back to Earth, the samples they will hold will be the first new, completely uncontaminated Martian rocks that scientists will get their hands on, ever. The ones they have easy access to right now were found in Antarctica by a team of meteorite hunters starting in the 1970s. That's me holding one of them. The rocks have been sitting there for thousands, if not millions of years. And scientists don't know where on Mars they came from or what their journey to the ice was like. Plus, there aren't a lot of them. So to really know if there's life outside of Earth, NASA needs rocks that are 100% Mars. So what's the solution? Limpia total, extreme cleanliness, to eliminate even the faintest traces of material that hints at earthly life. Because on Earth, we are absolutely surrounded in a just thick, thick soup of carbon organic material. That's Ian Clark. He's a systems engineer who's been working on the tubes for years. He and his colleagues at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory are taking cleaning to a whole new level. At JPL, we built an entirely new clean room, uh, cleaner than, than any of the clean rooms that we've ever used for our spacecraft in the past. In the super clean room, engineers went to town on the tubes. They blasted them with ultra pure air, rinsed them with deionized water, and cleaned them with exotic cleaning agents and high grade acetone. Yep, that's the stuff we use to remove our nail polish. But, you know, in a much purer form. And once wasn't always enough. Ian told me that sometimes they had to do this process over and over again. We would start to do something, we would send it to the chemistry lab to get measured, they'd come back and say, not clean enough. Clean enough meant that there couldn't be more than 150 nanograms or billionths of a gram of organic carbon on each of the tubes. So just how little is that? That is about a single very, 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 very fine grain of sand. There were also lower limits for certain kinds of carbon-containing compounds like DNA, which is the genetic code for life. To make sure the samples stay pristine, the engineers created a kind of contamination shield by treating the titanium tubes in a special way. Its advantage after the treatment? Unlike regular titanium, things don't stick to the surface as much. They kind of just slide off. And to catch any molecules that do manage to stay on, there's yet another barrier. It's basically a high-tech carbon contamination sucking sponge made of crushed sapphires. Why would we want to have a sponge of contamination on the tube? Well, we really don't want contamination inside the tube where the sample will be. But if there's something that's traveling its way there, if we can catch it and keep it uh, constrained before it finds its way inside the sample tube, then we'd much prefer to do that. Mars can get super hot, so the crystal sponge will also help the samples with temperature control. Engineers want to keep the temperatures inside the tubes cool. That way the rock's chemistry isn't altered over the many years the tubes will be sitting on the surface of Mars. 
All the tube's components need to be strong and durable because after that long wait is over, there's a whole other intricate part of the mission too, the journey back to Earth. Since the Perseverance rover can't fly and bring the tubes back to Earth on its own, a lander carrying another rover will go to Mars. That new rover will gather the samples and bring them back to the lander. The tubes will be loaded onto a rocket that will shoot them into Mars orbit. The tubes will be inside a special container. Meanwhile, another spacecraft will be sent to orbit Mars. That spacecraft will collect the Martian samples and start a months-long trip back to Earth. It's one of the most complicated, challenging, uh, and certainly exciting endeavors that I think we as a species have ever undertaken. So yeah, that's going to take some time. For now, the tubes aren't scheduled to come back to Earth until 2031. But that's only if every little thing goes exactly as planned, and if NASA and the European Space Agency get the funding for the sample return missions. Well, it's time to end this mission, but if you're interested in Mars or space in general, I've left some links down below for you. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss what we explore next. Hasta luego, nos vemos pronto. Gracias. Thank <laughs> you.